My family and my, my grandma particularly was a real inspiration to me because she had three children. She was widowed when my mum was two years old. My granddad died of polio. Her name was Grace and she lived her life with Grace and she just had a really good perspective on everything. She, her, it was always kind of, it'll all be all right in the end, dear. Don't worry, you know, it can't be that bad. And um, she never knew that, she knew that I was learning to fly. Um, I didn't get the chance to take her flying. Um, so she didn't really know that I ended up going on to do what I've done, but I definitely think that, you know, she would often say, she was proud of me and you know and when we went to New Zealand I can remember taking the phone call from Jim and this still chokes me up very embarrassing this happening now but um she just turned to me and said I will miss you dear <laughs> and um so she must have been a huge influence on my life because for her for me to be choked up about that and you know 20 years on it still smarts a bit that you know, I, I, did, I do miss her still. And yeah, she's definitely, her influence on me has definitely been something that I've carried with me through sort of difficult bits of my life, you know, when challenges have been thrown my way. So, Captain Emma Henderson, welcome to Inspirability. It's a great pleasure to have you on the show today. It's lovely to be here. Thank you for asking me. Oh, you're very, very welcome. So, you are Captain Emma Henderson. You are a professional speaker. You are the founder and CEO of Project Wingman. And you are also a star. <laughs> At the moment, you're trending. You're a star on Inside the Cockpit. But first of all, we'd like to just put it a little bit more into context. And I'd like you to tell me about Emma and, and who she is. Well, that is quite a mouthful, that title. And um, I certainly don't come from that, uh, yeah, the kind of background where I ever would have expected to find myself in this position. But I grew up in a small town in rural Essex. I don't come from a flying family. Um, I grew up in a very strong Christian family. So all my friends were the, from the church that I went to and grew up in. And that gave me quite a good background, I guess, in volunteering, because a lot of the things I did growing up were voluntary for charities. And basically, I did always have a love of flying. So I read Biggles books and my mum and dad took us to Duxford for trips out, I think, because they thought it would stop me and my brother from fighting. It didn't. But um, we would scramble all over aircraft there and... They, they'd take us to the science museum. My mum was a teacher and I'd come back with a book on, you know, with a model of a Montgolfier balloon and I was going to make, you know, I had paper Montgolfier balloons all over the place. So I kind of had this interest in flying, but I don't come from a flying family. I didn't even know until I was much older that there is an air cadets in the town where I grew up. So I went, I had a flying lesson at, at 18 for my birthday, but I went to university to study history because I wanted to be a lawyer, didn't quite get the grades for law, so I applied for history, did three years of a history degree, and I wanted to be a hotshot lawyer in, with a big office in London, bossing people around and you know wearing all the smart 1980s sharp suits that I had been surrounded by. My dad worked in the city. So um, I was never expecting to go into aviation at all. I loved my flying lesson for my 18th birthday and I said to dad, this is what I want to do. And he said, great, go and earn the money to pay for the lessons. And I was kind of like, well, I worked at Tesco's in the checkouts at the time and I thought it's going to take me a month to save up for one lesson. So I took a different path and I expected to end up in the city. I, ha I actually had a placement set up with a law firm for my summer holidays and things like that. And then in the first year at university, I had grown up sailing, so I raced dinghies around freezing cold reservoirs near Leeds, which is where I went. And then in my second year, I walked into Freshers' Fair and there was a big banner saying, learn to fly for free. And I thought, that looks great. So I went and found out about it and it was the University Air Squadron. And I applied. It was the second year that they had taken girls into the squadron to fly. And I applied and got a place on University Air Squadron. Uh, it was Yorkshire, 
the best squadron, obviously. Oh, no, I was on New Ass. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they were our arch rivals. <laughs> Absolutely. So, um, and we flew at Aria Finningley, and I went down there for my first weekend. You go down on, as you will know, having been on a University Air Squadron, you go down on a Friday night and have a lecture, and you spend Saturday and Sunday flying, and then you go back to university. And on the first Friday, I walked into the bar and I met somebody that I had previously met at a party in Leeds. He said, oh, let me introduce you to my mates. And it was like Turkey, Taff, Magoo, Jim. And I met Jim and I'm not joking. And he will back me up with this. I'm not joking that when I left that conversation, I thought I've just met the man I'm going to marry. It's a love at first sight. It was absolutely love at first sight. And 18 months later, 11 days after I graduated, we did get married. And that was 28 years ago. So that was a real pivotal moment for me. I'd already had this change from, I'm not going to do law now, I'm going to fly. Um, because I, I joined the squadron, I loved flying, I was okay at it. But then I met Jim and my life changed because of that. Because at the end of university, I submitted my papers to the Air Force. I got marginal for pilot and exceptional for navigator. I thought, I don't want to be a navigator. <laughs> And I was already getting married and Jim is a navigator and he was already posted to RAF Kinloss in the north of Scotland. And I thought, if I do join the Air Force, I'm not going to spend any time with him. There's no point marrying someone and then living 300 miles apart. So I got married and became a housewife and had babies. And that's, um, that was really the early part of, I'd, I'd done two years flying by that point. I didn't think I'd ever fly again after that. I thought, that's it. I've got to go and find something else to do now. So just going a little bit more into your childhood then, were there any main influences or any role models that you had growing up? Well, it was a very different world then. You know, I was born in the early 70s and we watched TV, but we didn't, there wasn't an internet. There wasn't social media. So the people I suppose that influenced me the most were the people I saw the most. And that would be, you know, my parents, my grandma. Um, my, my grandparents were featured very heavily in my early life the people that I, I I did meet some cool people so I got involved um, in a charity called Fellowship Afloat Charitable Trust which teaches people to sail on the black water in Essex it still exists and at the time it was on a Thames sailing barge called Memory I and through that I then met some people who ran a music festival called Greenbelt it was a big festival in Northamptonshire and we would go and work there in the shop because it got us free tickets into the music festival and got us backstage passes. So it was cool because I met people like Deacon Blue and it, you know, sat around talking to my idols. Um, so the people, I suppose, who influenced me in the 70s and 80s were people I read about in books or saw maybe occasionally on the TV. I didn't, other than obviously Morton Harkett. I mean, who wouldn't fancy him? But I didn't have the kind of idols or influences that people have today because you just didn't have access to that. When I wanted to look something up, I went and looked in an encyclopedia or went to the library. So my family and my, and my grandma particularly was a real inspiration to me because she had three children. She was widowed when my mum was two years old. My granddad died of polio and she never met anyone else. She was just, she was a really solid person to really look up to and admire so probably my grandma was one of the biggest influences in my life. And how do you think she helped shape you and maybe the path that you subsequently took? Well it was always very difficult to go to grandma with a problem because you'd say oh this has happened where is me and you'd be like I'm literally talking to someone whose husband died when she was you know in her 30s having any they'd only been married for about six years and she had three small children and you kind of think you have to really pitch it to your grandma when something not that important <laughs> has gone wrong in your life. So I think it was probably the, her name was Grace and she lived her life with Grace and she just had a really good perspective on everything. She, her, it was always kind of, it'll all be all right in the end, dear, don't worry, you know, it can't be that bad. And, um, you know, and she'd been widowed in the most horrible way. So you kind of, it probably gave me this idea that actually resilience is something you can choose to find, but that's not the same thing as keeping a stiff upper, lip, a stiff upper lip and refusing to talk about it and keeping all those emotions inside. It's okay to get those emotions out and say, actually, do you know what? I'm struggling with this. 
that it's actually not probably the end of the world. There's always somebody who's worse off. A lot of the challenges that we're going to talk about that you face later on, did that, did your grandma help you or just seeing your grandma, did that help you then deal with those challenges later or prepare you well for it? Well, my grandma died, sadly, when we were in New Zealand. Grandma came out to stay um, for Christmas one year and she died before we came home and I wasn't able to get home and see her. So she never knew that, she knew that I was learning to fly. Um, I didn't get the chance to take her flying because my mum and dad felt it would be too hard for her to climb up into the warrior that I was flying at the time because of its low wings and you know maybe a, a Cessna 172 would have been easier or something but um, so she didn't really know that I ended up going on to do what I've done but I definitely think that you know she would often say she was proud of me and you know and when we went to New Zealand I can remember taking the phone call from Jim so we didn't again phones were attached to walls and I was just taking grandma was staying and I was just taking the girls to ballet and as I was running out of the door late as always the phone rang and I thought I better just answer that and I rang it and Jim said we've got the New Zealand job and I was like great see you later I'm going to ballet didn't really think about that and I said to grandma when I got back in the car that was Jim we've got the New Zealand job and this still chokes me up very embarrassing this happening now but um she just turned to me and said I will miss you dear <laughs> and um so she must have been a huge influence on my life because for her for me to be choked up about that we went out there in 2003, so this is the back end of 2002. And, you know, 20 years on, it still smarts a bit that, you know, I, I, did, I do miss her still. And, yeah, she's definitely, her influence on me has definitely been something that I've carried with me through sort of difficult bits of my life, you know, when challenges have been thrown my way. Yeah, I, I can absolutely see how that has and, and how that, you know, carry that with you and how she's helped inspire you in a way to do everything that, that you've done and everything that, that you've become. I was very lucky to grow up in a family that was very supportive, very encouraging. There was no kind of, you can't do that because you're a girl. It was all very much, I mean, I did get a lot of, you're quite big for your boots, you need to simmer down a bit. But, um, you know, my parents were the same. They just, very supportive family. We were very close knit. You know, my mum's side of the family and my dad's side of the family, very close and very large and very loud. And, um, and then we had our church family as well. So we, you know, we grew up in this environment where I think actually um, the values I was taught growing up have been good to carry me through the rest of my life so far. So you said about being told you're too big for your boots as a child. Did your brother ever get told that? And are you similar? Well, no, we're not similar at all. I'm much prettier, um, <laughs> much funnier. He's actually much funnier than me. Um, we are very, very different people. Um, he is quite quiet and almost a bit brooding at times. But when he says something, it's really worth listening to. Whereas I'm just on full volume all the time. So I can understand why my parents would find that kind of, sometimes they'd be like, actually, can you just be quiet? <laughs> <laughs> and I was always, let's do this. And I've got this idea and I've got that idea. And yeah, so from a very young age, I, I was an ideas person. <laughs> but that's great because I think that enthusiasm channeled results in, you know, setting up Project Women, being awarded an MBE for your efforts, for being the star of Inside the Cockpit. You know, that enthusiasm, it's fantastic. It's, it's contagious. It's infectious. It's wonderful. <laughs> it, I think. I, it's lovely to hear that and, and I agree with you. I can understand why as a parent, now I'm a parent, I can understand why that's exhausting. I mean, my middle daughter um, is very similar and she's absolutely the most fun person to have at the party. But oh my goodness, just sometimes you want to turn the volume down a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm okay with that. You know, we need to have all types of people in the world. But my brother's turned out to be very resilient as well because... He was paralysed in a motorbike accident in 2010. He, lived, he moved to New Zealand in 2003 um, and has been there ever since. And he had a motorbike accident, which he was very lucky to survive. Bike didn't have a scratch on it. He broke pretty much everything and was really, really badly injured. And he did survive that. He was told he'd never walk again. And his attitude was, well, we'll see about that. It's not quite the words he used, but um, I won't repeat them. And so he basically, when he got his wheelchair, he had the handles taken off. He said, I'm not going to, I don't need to be pushed around. I will, he built his upper body strength up. 
and he can now cross a room with a stick to support him. But he can, if he's got things to sort of lean on, he can cross a room. And he basically said, I, I, look, I walked again. You told me I couldn't. So, you know, he's turned out, he's been to some very dark places as a result of that, but he's turned out to be very resilient as well. And um, he took up walker racing, which is outrigger canoes. And um, typically, being my brother, he couldn't just do walker racing. He competed for New Zealand in the Para World Championships and became world champion in Tahiti. And I just, Amazing. I just thought, really? It must be what? the kind of gene that you two have then, you and your brother, with this incredible resilience that you've both shown throughout life. I guess so. I think it's probably also that there was just no toler tolerance of, you know, we were never allowed to mope. And, um, you know, and my parents were just very practical about, you know, problem solving. And, and they were very much, you know, we're very lucky. We have a roof over our heads. Everything that my parents ever have, and, well, had and have, they share with people who need it. They still, they still believe that. We grew up in a house where, you know, there were always people. We had a, an Angolan refugee who came to live with us and we had a, a guy who from Slovenia who my mum and dad met his parents on holiday and he turned out to be going to the same school we were at, so he came to live with us. And there were other people in our house all the time and it was the place that we all went to to hang out in the evenings because it was big enough and also my parents were very chilled out and welcoming and so... Actually, you know, when I talk about it like that, I think what an idyllic childhood I had. It's an incredible support network that I think you had around you as well. And I think maybe sometimes it's only later on in life that we then look back and, you know, like with you, with your grandma, and you can say, OK, well, actually, she taught me resilience from a very young age. I didn't realise it at the time, but now I can draw Absolutely. on those skills. So at the time, you know, so she moved to my parents' town um, within about a year of them getting married. So when I was born, they lived in a house up the road from grandma. And from a, I walked at 10 months, which drove my mum nuts. And, um, you know, my phrase was, I do it, I do it. And, um, and my mum would let me, knowing that my grandma was at the other end of the street, she'd let me sort of wander off down the quite short cul-de-sac. She'd let me wander off down because my grandma was sort of watching from the other end from quite a young age because I think it was just the only way to stop me. No, I do it. <laughs> you know, so... Um, incredible independence then at just 10 months. Yeah, but you don't realise that when you're growing up, do you? I mean, I was a typical teenager because I had massive fights with my mum at three in the morning, you know, still at going at three in the morning and my dad and my brother would be like, will you just stop because we want to sleep? And we've talked about it since and we don't really know what we were fighting about. It was just this flash of personalities, you know. So Emma, you moved to New Zealand with your husband um, at, well, in your 20s, I think you said. Yeah. How was that change? Because that must have been a huge life change for well, both of you. Well, it was a massive life change and it was something we hadn't expected because we'd moved to Kinos, we fell in love with it, we still live there and we thought that we were going to settle there and be there forever. And my husband had sort of said, well, we can spend as much time as possible. The Nimrod's always going to be here. We'll, I'll make sure we come back to Kinloss all the time. Maybe I can commute. So we built a house. After seven years of living there, we built a house. And um, when I say I, we built it, we built it. You know, the rugby club would turn up at eight o'clock on a Saturday morning and drive dumper trucks around the site and mix cement. And I genuinely don't know how any of the children are still alive. But... Um, and we decided to settle and we put the children into, or we put Thomas into a local school because he was the only one that was school age. And we said, we're not like normal Air Force families, we're staying. And um, then this opportunity came up to go to New Zealand on exchange. And we'd already applied for and not been successful with an exchange to Florida, which I had been quite pleased about because I was really worried about, I didn't want to go. And so we hadn't got the Florida exchange and that was kind of great. And then he came home one day and said, I've been asked to apply. Well, he said, my name has been put on a list of people that they are thinking of sending to New Zealand on exchange. And I can remove myself from the list if you'd like me to. And I was quite stroppy, um, as I'm sure I'm already giving the impression of, but I'm quite forceful about what I think. And I, and I didn't want to move to New Zealand. My brother had married a New Zealander. I didn't like her. I didn't get on with her. I thought, I don't want to go and live in a country if everyone's like that from New Zealand. I just don't want to be among them. And um, I stomped out of the house. I'm not going. You can go if you want to. 
And I came back inside a few minutes later and I thought, this is ridiculous. We've got to put our names on, we've got to keep our names on the list because if we turn this opportunity down, we'll never know what could have happened. And actually, if we're not supposed to go there, we won't get the job anyway. And of course, we did get the job. And I couldn't really understand why. We were, we'd, we'd built this house. We had lived in it for about six months or so when this exchange came up. And it was, we were told in the October of 2002 that we were going in February 2003. So we had something like 12 weeks to finish off the house to get it into a livable state because we had moved in and were finishing it as we were living there. Find somebody to rent it, get visas, pack all our, we were allowed to take nine cubic meters of belongings with us. So work out what we were taking, what we were leaving. There were three weeks over that 12 week period where the New Zealand passport office was closed because it was Christmas and we were leaving um, in February 2003. Wow. So it was quite a big kind of swerve ball. Huge upheaval. Huge upheaval. Um, and we just moved into our house, you know, I was like, but surely we're supposed to be here. But the opportunity came along and we packed everything up and we managed to work out what we were taking and what we were leaving and we managed to find tenants. And I turned 30 in February 2003. It was actually a week after my 30th birthday that we moved out there and we found ourselves a um, 14 hour flight from LA. We flew to LA, 10 hours to LA in business class with a five year old, a three year old and a 20 month old. And then we had three days in LA. We went to um, Malibu and to um, Disney and had an amazing sort of break there. And then 14 hours through to Auckland and about three hours out of Auckland, our 20 month old Megan started throwing up and she didn't stop for a week. So I learned then that there is something that affects young children called traveler's gastro. <laughs> oh. We had business class seats because if there was a rule that if you were traveling for more than 24 hours, you had to travel business class. So you could just imagine all these people that had actually paid for their seats thinking, what is going on here? Um, and we landed in Auckland in, it must have, I think it was the very beginning of March, 2003. And I stepped off that plane and I thought, it feels like I've come home. It was just this amazing feeling. Um, and we were so welcomed by everybody that we came across in New Zealand. The, the New Zealand Air Force had pushed out all the stops to, they, they provided us with a beautiful weatherboard house on a corner with a big garden and they redecorated it and painted it. And it was really lovely. And we stayed in a, we stayed in a, a hotel for a few days when we arrived while all our stuff came and everything. And I look back on that and I think, thank goodness I didn't put a stop to us going because it turned out to be the best decision we ever could have made. It was a bit of career suicide for my husband because um, he could have probably gone further up the ranks quicker, but it was the best decision for us as a family. And we literally had the best three and a half years we could ever have had. And, and it also allowed me to spend three and a half years closer to my brother who lived two hours up the road with his wife and family who were all similar ages, which I never would have had if we had stayed in Scotland. So you were very much going outside of your comfort zone to move to New Zealand. Yeah, absolutely. And I just, I just thought, what are we doing? It's the other side of the world. We've got a tiny family. We won't have any support there because obviously there are no parents there all the support networks we would normally have fallen back on with our friends on the base and our parents, they weren't there, but it was the most amazing three and a half years of our lives. I mean, it, it, I find it very bizarre that it's actually 20 years ago that we moved there. You know, it feels like we have just got back, you know, so um, it was amazing. So how did you deal with that then? So your husband said, we're going to New Zealand and you're going, absolutely not. And then you end up going and it's amazing. But that process of going from absolutely not to, wow, this is great and it's, you know, an incredible thing that I've done. How did you, what was the journey that you took through those steps in terms of accepting and, and dealing with being out of your comfort zone? Well, I often think that you have to be a certain type of person to be a military wife because you, you don't choose where you live. And every single posting we've ever had, I've said, I'm not living in that house. It's awful. I don't want to go there. It's rubbish. And I've always ended up having a really brilliant time. So I think there is this kind of, Nobody really likes change, but actually once you know something's going to happen, you just want to get on with it. So, you know, 
I think nobody really ever wants to change their circumstances. Everybody's pretty comfortable where they are. But actually what I learned probably from that posting is that change brings about huge opportunity and huge chances to do things that you just would never have done otherwise. You know, if I hadn't lived in New Zealand, I probably would have stayed quite attached to the apron strings. You know, I basically got married at 22 and became my mother, who's, which is not a bad thing. She's lovely, but she's also 24 years older than me. And I actually, going to New Zealand allowed me to kind of discover who I was as Emma Henderson and not as Jerry's daughter or Anne's daughter or Jim's wife, you know, and I've always introduced my, when people have said, oh, you're Jim's wife, aren't you? And I've always said, no, I'm Emma Henderson. I am married to him, but I'm not going to be defined as that. And um, I've always had this kind of strong sense of independence, but it really allowed me to find out who I was. I found it to be a very supportive culture. Um, and I took up triathlons when I was out there. I went out there as a very fat, unhealthy, um, I'd had three children in three and a half years. Um, I wasn't very healthy and I took up running initially at night so nobody could see me. And then I started doing triathlons. And if I had said to my friends at home, I'm doing a triathlon on Sunday. Do you want to come and watch me? They'd be like, why on earth are you doing that? What weirdo. Um, but my friends in New Zealand said, well, what time does it start? We'll come down. They'd come down to the beach at four, three or four in the morning, cheer me on as I went into the water in first wave, you know, Great. It was a really different, very, very um, encouraging kind of culture to be living in. And I know that that's not necessarily true of all New Zealanders and all of New Zealand, but certainly the ones I know and the ones we lived with and the ones that we've met and been friends with for such a long time have all been that kind of person. So in terms of advice you can give to our viewers and listeners then about embracing change, because this is such a, a powerful story to hear how you changed you know, your, yourself from the Emma you were before you moved to New Zealand and the Emma, you became running triathlons and everything else. What advice could you give to our viewers and listeners about firstly, embracing change, not being scared of change, and also surrounding yourself with the right people? Yeah, well, that would be it, I think, is, you know, nobody likes change. It's uncomfortable, but embrace it because actually you, you can see change as being a huge challenge or you can see change as being a huge opportunity. You just don't know what's going to come your way if you're brave enough to step through that door and say, I'm, I'm, I'm going to accept this change to my life. Um, you, you'll meet amazing people. You'll have new opportunities. And I do think it changes how you feel about the world and how you, how you think about your own life and your own self. And, and one thing I think about moving overseas, and I've found this with a lot of expats I've spoken to, is it really does, you know, I probably had quite a narrow field of vision when I, you know, when I had got married and I'd moved to Kinloss and, you know, there were certain things I'd been brought up with that, you know, divorce is bad and, you know, affairs and not that I'm saying affairs are good and divorce is good, but, you know, I've become much, much more accepting of things around me and much more open to ideas and open-minded about things as a result, I think, of removing ourselves from our comfort zone and the place that we had built as our nest and our safe shelter and just having to put ourselves out there and go and meet people who didn't already know me. I mean, the great thing about that is if you move to a country 12,000 miles away and nobody's met you before, you can be whoever you want to be. So I didn't reinvent myself in terms of like telling everybody I was an astronaut or something, but I was able to find out who I was and then meet people that I might not have been friends with previously because they might not have been interested in me because I was, I was probably a bit of a knob in my 20s to be honest with you and I hope I'm not so much of that now but you know it definitely gave me a much better perspective on life and and just to be more accepting of of life um, and absolutely you have to surround yourself with the right people and 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 that translates really well across to business as well because Having the right people around you in life is so important because you have to have a support network, whether you are working on a Tesco's checkout, as I did when I was younger, or whether you are, you know, the CEO of um, Apple still has a support network around them. You know, it's not, it, it's not something that is restricted to people like me who are sitting doing a podcast saying, oh, yeah, you can you know, embrace it. Everybody needs a support network. And a great example of that was actually... Um, Carolyn McCall, who was the CEO of my airline when I worked for them, 
she came in and said from um, The Guardian and said, I don't know anything about running an airline, but I know how to run a business. And she surrounded herself with the right people to make sure she was making sound business decisions for an airline. And then she went off to ITV and did the same thing. So she's actually somebody I really ad admire and really look up to. And um, so it just goes to show that it's the same for everybody. You don't have to know everything about what's going to come next. And actually, it's probably more exciting if you don't.